So recently I've been thinking about this question because I teach an introduction to film studies class, as you know, and um, when I tell people outside of academia and outside of university, like what it is I do, they're often sort of like, what? <laughs> you teach movies? What does that even mean? I thought I thought that was just sort of acting. People, people ask me if I teach acting, uh, which is kind of interesting and I think tells you a lot about what people think about or know about movies. Um, so I mean, what is film studies and what's it good for? Sorry? I mean, acting is part of it, but that's true. A very small part of it, I would say. <laughs> <laughs> but it's like how small, right? Yeah, well, I mean, it's kind of everything that is on the screen and everything that goes into making what is on the screen. So I suppose the people in the screen and what they're doing is part of it, but um, there's a lot more. Um, it is an art, so there's like um, the cinematography and then there's like colors, costume, and that's like the whole mise-en-scene. And then there's the whole what goes into making it. So it's like where everyone is on the screen and the camera. Um, gosh, I forgot, the, <laughs> I forgot the name now. <laughs> um, like the different shots, there we go. And like editing, that's a big part of it too. So, I mean, it isn't just, it's more than what the people on the screen are doing because the people on the screen are doing what they're doing for a reason. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I think um, most people probably see movies and then they are kind of so attenuated to the people on screen that they don't really think they don't think about anything else sort of on, on a, um, on a kind of um, uh, surface level of like, what do they think about the movie? They'll think about the people that they saw and whether or not the acting was sort of good, but there are other things at play that they might not be um, aware of at the forefront of their mind, but there's stuff going on in the background, let's say that um, is still um, working on them. They just don't maybe realize it. Yeah. Well, I imagine if like they saw a film and like it was filmed through a, I don't know, window <laughs> instead of like the over the shoulder shot or something like that. I think most people would notice that's a little strange. They would maybe question it when it's a bit more obvious, but um, because we're used to seeing certain um, shot types, we kind of just think, oh, that's just how it is. We don't think about, oh, they were purposely positioned that way. So it's kind of, I do see why people see it that way, but it's because kind of filmmakers have made us see it that way yeah so kind of like you learn how to see movies from a very yeah. young age yeah so essentially what we're talking about is people who you know every everybody watches movies everybody watches tv nowadays of course everybody always did and when they think about what you do when you go out into the street and you tell them you know this is what I studied English and film what do they usually think about that um I'm kind of typically might be the ooh <laughs> at first and then it's kind of well you know what what is that what does it entail really and it's kind of well because it is English literature and film I kind of explain it well what do you study when you study English it's like the history of it and you know um, what went into writing said book or you know why it is written that way it's kind of similar with film um why is it shot this way what is the history of it except I would say with film, there's a little bit more because you can actually see it. So for example, um, I'd say like with a book, um, the author might describe a uh, color in a particular way. With a film, you kind of see it a little bit more and it is, everything on the screen is intentional. There are no, well, that could be a mistake, but you know, the mistakes are put in there intentionally. So that it's a little bit more than, English literature it's kind of if you could see a book <laughs> if that makes sense <laughs> if you could see yeah, I mean I guess you can see a book but ultimately what what literature studies like like comparative literature studies and yeah. such as sort of focus on is what you can convey with the written word it always comes yeah. down to the written word right yeah. books and poetry and um, short stories are always about the written word like you can't yeah 
sort of appreciate it without first and foremost talking about the language. And even if you're talking about the imagery, it's always how words create images, yeah. right? Which well, with movies, you don't need words to create images. I mean, you can, yeah. you can have somebody have like a brilliant speech and you sort of visualize what they're saying in that moment that you're watching them say the speech, but um, movies can also just be representative of the things that they're talking about, right? So they can just yeah. show rather than tell. Yeah, it's kind of like if um, more books use like different fonts, different colored pages, kind of like the way children's books are set up. Like if in English literature, we studied like the shape of the book or like things like that, like things that aren't, they're there, but they're not necessarily studied in English literature. That's what we're studying in film. Like the things that are there that are typically ignored because everything there is put there for a reason. Whereas I'd find with books, I mean, there's just a way that they have to be printed past a certain like um, genre, I'd say, past the children's genre. You know, it's Times New Roman or, you know, you can't, there's not much creative freedom, I would say. Whereas in yeah. film, you know, it's your film, <laughs> you can do what you'd like. It kind of, to the, to an extent, totally. But most movies do conform to a kind of, yeah. I guess, formula, right? So they usually have characters. Oftentimes they have a single main character. Um, it's usually spoken in some language, right? Like it could be English or any other language. Yeah. Um, and it's usually set in a certain place in time, even if that time is like fantastical, like Star Wars or Bridgerton, right? Or it's like yeah. sort of like fantastical old timey towns or whatever. Um, so it, it's always set in some place, um, you know, whereas like you could imagine characters kind of living in a void almost in um, in books, even though they don't, obviously, most of the time. Uh, but it's a lot. That would be a lot harder to do. Right. In, <laughs> yeah. In a movie, you know, and I kind of or feel even, like that. Um, that kind of structure it makes the films that kind of break away from that structure more interesting to study. Because let's say there was a film where they were in a void. <laughs> <laughs> like that was I always think whenever I think about movies set in in strange or unusual places, my go to example is The Fountain. Have you ever seen The Fountain? No, I haven't seen The Fountain. It's kind of three vignettes, right? And so he's um, uh, Hugh Jackman is uh like th he's in outer space <laughs> he's sort of floating in this like space bubble in thousands of years in the future like this is what it's become of of like um humanity and it is kind of like a void but there are so few examples of that like yeah. um uh which i mean there's so few examples of that in literature too so what are we even talking about but <laughs> it is really hard <laughs> to conceive of you know, um, any kind of artwork that's not a time and a place. I mean, like, how could, you know, could there be, could there be, um, oh, I guess there's paintings, right? Lots of paintings can be so abstract, but yeah. they don't have time and place. Um, but most paintings do, right? Most paintings are, are representative of something, you know, there's a cow in a field by a lake and some trees. And yeah. it's I mean, there's also a banana taped to a wall somewhere. So, I mean, art is art. <laughs> That's true. I guess I guess just like movies. But what I think what I like most about movies is that they is when they lean into their moviness, yeah. when they become sort of meta, they become sort of self-aware and sort of about um, the filmmaking process itself. Um, I always love it when, you know, there are filmmakers in movies or if it's about filmmaking of some kind yeah. or people look down the lens of the camera or there's like a jump cut, jump cut, anything that kind of calls your attention to the movie making process within the fiction. I, I always find really entertaining. I love, like um, the Truman Show. Yeah. Yeah, I love the Truman Show. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I remember when that movie came out, I was like a teenager and I remember everybody walked out of the cinema like this. <laughs> where are the cameras you know it totally yeah. changed the way that people thought about their world for at least a few days I think everybody who went to see that movie for the first time you know felt like that did you wh when did you see that movie do you remember gosh um I think I was probably a teenager too but it definitely wasn't when it came out um I think we had it on dvd 
and oh gosh dvds <laughs> it's a while ago now but yeah i kind of i didn't understand it at first and i was thinking you know is this kind of like um kind of like a black mirror type thing and it, it was before black mirror but it's kind of like a similar thing like um he kind of became self-aware but he was the only one that was unaware in the first place and like as a teenager I was kind of like whoa <laughs> like <laughs> is that me like am I on a tv show it definitely made me quite suspicious but um I think it definitely influenced other shows to kind of focus on that whole you know kind of meta type thing yeah we live in a simulation and there are cameras following us around you just don't know where they are yeah. <laughs> they're hidden everywhere <laughs> everybody had that experience and it's good to know that it's not just from watching it in the cinema um but you can have that experience with the german show from watching it on your television in your living room you know um it's su it's such an impactful movie in that way okay i want to talk about favorite films okay <laughs> so whenever i tell people what i do for a living or what i study they always the, they're they're they always have the same kind of reaction which we just talked about where they're kind of like huh mm, that's that's weird like that's exciting but what is that and then I try to explain a little bit of it but um I usually get interrupted because they just are dying to know what my favorite movie is <laughs> yeah. I don't know really why I can I can't understand why so what's your is this is this similar has this happened to you as well yes and I hate that question <laughs> I hate it because I think I like a lot of films but I feel like when it comes to like something that I like really love it's always a series so when I get asked like what my favorite film is I always have to think like well what film do I think they would like because there's so many so I just kind of like for a second analyze them as a person and I'm like hmm I think you would like insert film <laughs> Yeah. You know what? I, I do exactly the same thing. And I wonder if that's a film scholar thing to do, because we've seen so many movies that it's hard to sort of pick a, a specific one yeah. um, and talk about why why that's the movie that um, you love so much. Even though you could e easily answer that question, you're just kind of concerned that they'll stick their nose up and go, well, I don't like science fiction or I don't like romantic <laughs> comedies or whatever. Yeah. So because they're looking, I think ultimately we recognize why people um, want to know that question. And it's probably to do with the fact that they want a good movie recommendation. Like what should they, what should they watch that they would really love? Um, but I think you put, put the nail on the head, which is like, you can't always randomly guess correctly what people's <laughs> tastes are. You kind of need to know more about them. I think um, my, friend, my answer <laughs> would differ between like if a film scholar asked me compared to like my neighbor. Like I would probably have to come up with like the most beautifully made film if it was a film scholar. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You want to impress those people out there. This is why I have a just stock answer, which is Star Wars, as you know. Yeah. Um, I just use that as my stock answer because typically everybody's aware of Star Wars. I wouldn't say yeah. that everybody has seen Star Wars anymore. I mean, there, it used to be the case that everybody had seen Star Wars, but I recognize now it's a new generation, new generations, right? Um, it didn't even, I, I wasn't even born when that movie came out. Okay, not even me. So <laughs> you know, I was like a little, little kid watching it on the TV screen, you know, probably like a VHS cassette or something of, of Star Wars it was probably the first time I ever saw that movie. Um, and yet it was, you know, I was completely dazzled by it. Um, it made me love movies. It made me want to become a filmmaker and a screenwriter and go study movies at the university level. And um, I still love that movie. I still, you know, secretly want to be Princess Leia and join the rebellion and fight, you know, uh, the bad guys. So, you know, I mean, there's still a lot to be said about that movie. Not that it's not problematic you know obviously it has its issues which we can probably yeah. save for another podcast but um <laughs> yeah I just I think it's a really good representation of what I'm all about um when it comes to film studies so that's that's why I always pick Star Wars because people are aware of it um they would have a good 
understanding as to why I would pick that movie. So I don't really have to explain it that much. And a lot of times people just sort of th- think it's really funny. <laughs> like I'm supposed to pick some, you know, like French New Wave film or something that they've never heard of. They they almost want me to to pick something, you know, to to say something that sounds esoteric and dreamy, but and that's why I just say Star Wars. That's like me with Harry Potter. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, me. <laughs> Great example. yeah. I don't think I would ever say that, like typically, like, oh, what's your favorite film? Oh like the fourth Harry Potter film, which is the best <laughs> one, by the way. <laughs> so when people ask you what your favorite film is, do they then want to tell you what their favorite film is? Um, No, they typically just talk about whatever I've said, which is typically just a series instead of a film. I usually just say Black Mirror because I love Black Mirror <laughs> and I recommend everyone watch it. <laughs> I'm too scared to watch all of Black Mirror, though. It's not scary. It is scary. The first pilot episode I turned off. I still have never watched the pilot episode of Black Mirror. Because it just, it looks grotesque. And I I just, I just don't want that burned into my brain, you know? I don't know what happens. And I don't want to know. Okay. There's certain movies out there and TV shows that I just don't want to see. You can't unsee things, you know? Yeah. I I do get that because there's a lot of horror films that I want to watch for the storyline, but I physically cannot watch them because just they're just terrifying. No, it's hard. I'm I I'm really bad about it. I'm a very bad horror movie watcher because it gets under my skin too quickly and I just um, I can't stop thinking about it and then they I have, have really good films they're just terrifying but once you get past that they're really good films <laughs> I, I have watched I should say I have watched a fair amount of Black Mirror but I always sort of scan it and if it's too scary I just skip and then go to the next one <laughs> so there's a fair amount of Black Mirror that I haven't seen because it's just too scary and I would have skipped it <laughs> That is fair enough. I mean, you can watch each episode as is anyway. They're not linked. So I recommend just watching it backwards. With the lights on and some of them. (laughs) They're not scary. Like some of them are quite dark, but other ones like there's one with Miley Cyrus in it. And it's literally just about her being a childhood pop star. And I can't really remember, but I mean, it's not that's scary. horrifying enough. <laughs> yeah. <I'm sold. laughs> you got Sorry. Point. Sorry, Miley. Let's go back to the utility of film studies. How can it be beneficial, do you think, for people outside the discipline to know about or be aware of in, a, in, in and of itself? So is there kind of a benefit for people outside of academia, outside of university studying to be aware of the discipline of film studies? Like, is is there any kind of utility to it? Like, what's it good for at all? I would say if you're a creative person at all, it's definitely worth studying. Um, It's kind of like, um, if you're a creative person, you know, there's like um, lots of different forms of art. Whereas I'd say film studies kind of combines all of that with what I would say is daily living for us like a lot of social media is film a lot of people you know their form of preferred entertainment is film like something on a screen so I'd say it kind of um it kind of forces you to think about things you wouldn't usually think of like some like parts of your daily life in a creative way for example your favorite show once you've studied film studies you see in a completely different light you understand things a bit more you might even for example, want to make your own films, which I think is a really good idea, even if it's just a silly film. And I'd say, especially with like the rise of TikTok, like people are making films, people are making videos more often. Like if you like to watch them, it's worth studying. Um, but that's just my opinion. I would say um, there, there's a lot of film studies. There are a lot of different parts. So it's kind of whichever part calls you the most, whether it's like analyzing them, making them, Um, you know, studying the history of them, it's worth looking into, I would say. Yeah, I love the idea of people, I was going to say regular people, but somehow that sounds like we're not regular people. (laughs) 
people that don't make this sort of what they're all about, but it's just a part of their life, but not the main part of their life. Um, you know, I would love to see more films made by those people. In other words, um, I think everybody, you're so right to bring up TikTok, right? People are making movies, whether they think of them as movies or not, right? They're making moving images with their mobile phones and cutting them together. And I think the moment that you turn the camera on and pick where to point it, you're a filmmaker, right? Um, and then TikTok brings into this brings in this whole new level, which is that you then get to edit it and do sound design in very sophisticated, uh, to some extent, ways. Um, okay, it's you're not going to be making Steven Spielberg like films um, with that with those like little bits of technology thrown together, but but you could actually you know cre tell a story, you know yeah. you could tell a story, and I'd love I'd love to know what stories people want to tell. Yeah, I agree. I think it's I think filmmaking is kind of an essential skill at this point. It's something that's worth looking into just even if even if you're really bad at it just try it it's kind of like I think it should be taught at primary school level even <laughs> because we are getting to a point where you know it's a part of everyone's life technology has advanced to the point where you know it's something everyone could do so why not learn how to do it yeah it's kind of like learning how to write letters right? yeah I mean people complain that we don't Supposedly, we don't teach children how to write in cursive anymore, and I'm not even sure to what extent that's even true, but, um, you know, kind of so what? If we don't use cursive, who cares? Why not instead let's teach them, you know, how to turn a camera on and how yeah. to do a bit of editing and how to kind of communicate um, more effectively through images and, and sounds, which is what movies are all about, right? Yeah, like I would say before, like, typewriters, we didn't teach children how to type or you know, it wasn't really important, it wasn't essential, but now we have these pieces of technology, like everything has a camera now, <laughs> so you That's might true. as well learn to use it. <laughs> That's a really good point, you know? Yeah. I mean, uh, it's become an essential tool and, 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 and therefore an essential skill would emerge out of having that tool with us all the time. I mean, you're, yeah. you're absolutely right. I mean, when, when parents come up to me in open days and go, you know, why should I let my child study film studies instead of something that's more, you know, um, uh, uh, glamorous like English literature? <laughs> <laughs> Although I don't know if that's glamorous anymore, but I mean, the, the, there's always that question, right? Um, why should I study this as, a, as, as opposed to something else? Or why should I dedicate, you know, any time to this particular discipline? And I say, well, you know, I mean, a lot of people read books, right? Yeah, they do. It's true. People read all the time. We read text messages, we read books, we read magazine articles, we read newspaper articles. But I don't know anyone that doesn't watch TV. Yeah. <laughs> you know? I mean, At the end of the day, every but the common denominator is movies. Yeah. And moving I mean, you can see before you can read. <laughs> That's you right. You just need to know how to see. I mean, and even if you can't see, like, you know, there's the sound design of the film. I mean, there's Foley, there's a lot goes into it and it's uh, as someone who studied both English literature and film I would say with English literature it just about touches the surface of you know um being an author I would say I would say now being an author it means a lot more than just writing a story you can make a story into something that people can look at and experience through screen or window I don't know <laughs> yeah Why you can just it turn it on yeah in a way that you kind of you you said it so much more elegantly than the way I'm going to put it you know you don't have to learn how to watch a movie yeah you know I mean you have to learn how to read uh obviously books can be read to you right I mean I read to my two-year-old daughter all the time and she loves books even though she can't read but and she can sort of fake read to herself, right? She opens the yeah. book and sort of looks at the pictures and points at stuff. And, and so she sees the elephant on the page, even though she doesn't know the word elephant above it. Um, so she can sort of read the images. But when she's doing that, you know, um, she's using a, a, a very kind of like primal built in sort of uh, uh element of knowledge rather than yeah. something that she would have had she would have to gain through study you know so 
that's what we're doing when we're watching movies. We're just sort of like a two-year-old looking at a picture book and going like, I can see the elephant. Yeah. <laughs> and I mean, it, films do kind of just act out. They do read their own book to you. You don't need someone to watch a film for you, if that makes sense. That's right. Yeah. So it's kind of like um, like if you want to see a performance on a stage, um, you know, you are sat in a particular place and where the audience sits and you're watching it like that. Whereas with a film, you know, they can place the audience wherever they want to place in the scene. So it's kind of, um, it's just a more in-depth thing. <laughs> I'm not very good at explaining, but it's just more in-depth, I would say. That's why we love it. Yeah. <laughs> I think. It's one of those things where it begs the question, like, why is it so great? But then it's like just sort of evident if in the material, you know, like watch yeah. anything that you love. And you're like, that's why it's so great. Yeah. Pick a movie that you love. And um, that's that's why we love the study of films. Yeah. I will say studying film will make you slightly more annoying to people you watch films with. <laughs> Because you're like, oh, that's three point lighting. <laughs> like, you'll start to notice different things. And, you know, like, um, I always say with my fiance, like, oh, you know, they recorded that post production, right? <laughs> like, <laughs> right. Just little things like, like that. Get, get the heck out of here. Like, shush, shush. Yeah. do you get shushed a lot? I get shushed. Yeah. All the time when I watch. But it's them. like, you need to know. I'm just letting you know. Just that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, my my actually my husband really um appreciates when I point like little flubs out. He'll, I'll go like yeah. that doesn't make any sense. Like that that's a flaw. And he'll go like <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> yeah, one of the things I thought was interesting about TikTok is that people are using it to advertise the things that they do, not just the yeah. things that they sell. Like obviously there's a lot of product placement and things like that. But it's sort of, you know, a, a way to get out sort of community events and stuff. I mean, obviously it's like an international thing. So if you're, you're hosting something like in your local community, it's maybe less useful because it's like why advertise to the whole world when you really just need to be targeting to specific communities. But I see this as a kind of tool that will probably come next from TikTok, which is sort of maybe like local TikTok, you know, so that there will be, um, there will be perhaps a tab or, or something where you can you can advertise what you're doing through video to a local community so that yeah. people come come and do stuff like you know events organization and stuff. I mean it's already happening. But you know, I, I see events and stuff and I go, well that sounds great, but I don't live in London. So <laughs> Yeah. I mean a lot of things are in London. I think that's the first issue. But I would say um with TikTok and like your local community it only really focuses on like your contacts which I find quite strange because you know if I wanted to tell someone in my contacts something I would just tell them <laughs> yeah that makes sense whereas it doesn't really um there is the repost feature but it doesn't really go as far as for example like Facebook if you share something on Facebook then you know it gets shared and shared and shared and because it's public eventually someone outside of your circle will see it Whereas on TikTok, it would just go anywhere, like completely across the globe. So, um, I mean, it is a good thing, kind of, because then, you know, things go viral and maybe you want to, you know, spread awareness of something. But when it comes to something that you want to um, advertise, sorry, my laptop has not been plugged in this entire time. <laughs> um, when it comes to something that you want to advertise locally you know it's not I wouldn't say it's the best thing unless you go on TikTok live I would say a lot of the time on TikTok live I see like someone just stood in the city center just down the road but they definitely need to work on the algorithm I would say yeah yeah but it's something that's probably in the works right or or, yeah. or an app like it I would imagine is just on the horizon if I've learned anything from the fact that when I started university, there was no such thing as social media. No. <laughs> I can't believe that. <laughs> I mean, not not to the extent that we know it today, like not in its current form of, 
you know, Facebook. Yeah. Facebook didn't exist when I started uni. And by the end of university, um, it did exist, but it was still um, only available to people in universities. It started as something that I think was only available to certain universities, like the sort of elite American universities. And then Zuckerberg started to open it up to all American universities and then probably like other universities outside of the United States too. And at the stage which I joined, I think it was just university students who could have accounts. And um, and it didn't have a feed, there was no wall or anything like that. It didn't have instant messaging. Um, it was just, you could post, I think you could, it was just really like a Facebook. It was just sort of like the phone book, but of faces. <laughs> and, <laughs> and you could send personal messages to, to each other. Yeah, you probably could, um, uh, but it definitely didn't have a wall. That was something that came a little bit later. And I think the photographs were kind of around there as well. Um, we all had MySpace accounts, which is still around, I think, for some reason, but um, pretty defunct. And, you know, that's what is one of the ways that people connected, like, you know, instead of getting a telephone number, you know, you would you would exchange social media. And that was brand new. Right. That was brand new when I was um, about 20, 22 years old. Like that was all starting to happen. So, um, you know. Where am I going? Where am I going with this? <laughs> proving, proving my, my street cred. No, that is, it, is, it is really I mean, interesting. You know, to give perspective, YouTube didn't exist yet. Um, I was one of the first people on YouTube to use it to start um, uh, hosting uh, business videos. So I, I worked as a video editor for a company that needed a place to host video that I was producing. And at the time you could upload up to 10 minutes, that was the limit, onto YouTube. And I cut short, you know, little little interview movies together for um, a business to business publication. And that's pretty much how I, I fed myself after university. But yeah, I mean, so I can I can tell you from my experience of social media, from the beginning of Facebook, when it was really cool and selective, and there was a sort of gated community aspect about it to what it is now, which is like something for your parents. Yeah. <laughs> but social media is not, is not a forever thing. I mean, social media itself is probably here to here to stay. But any particular app that calls itself, you know, this is the one. This is the one that we're all going to live on. I mean, yeah. right now it's TikTok, right? Yeah. But who's to say? In I mean, just last year, nobody could think that there would be, ever be anything to shake Twitter, right? Yeah. <laughs> and we yeah. all see how that went, right? So I think I think we're, and there are probably still people who doubt that Twitter will sort of completely crumble. Um, and fair enough. But, you know, I think what, what I've learned is that in my 20 plus years of engaging with this kind of stuff online is that nothing's really, you know, um, impenetrable with respect to like an app, you know? I mean, yeah. There's stuff that um, seems like it's going to be here forever, but just you wait, because there will be some app to come along that will probably replace it. And it will be used for other things. I mean, it's not to say that any of these apps are going to be, you know, not around. Like I said, I think MySpace is still a thing. <laughs> well, if you think about how TikTok started, I mean, it was, I would say it was advertised more to like younger children. It was like, um, it was called Musical.ly before. And they would just like lip sync to like different songs. And then, you know, when lockdown happened, like um, it changed to like TikTok and like, you know, the age of the users went up and up and up. And it was still like just for jokes. But like now, like you can sell things on there. Like people are using it for advertising. People are, you know, this film talk. And it's really interesting because I find that, you know, social media it was completely text based. And well, mostly text based. And then it went to like being mostly image based with like um, Tumblr and Instagram, because that's what was big when I was growing up. And then now it's just videos like. Um, I think before videos, it was GIFs. GIFs were like huge <laughs> because it was kind of like you don't have to watch a whole video, or press play. They would just kind of do a silly little short, I don't know, dance. <laughs> 
and they're like now like no one uses gifts and that's quite sad <laughs> i think like i everyone mean just- it's funny because like certain generations still use gifts because they've just caught <laughs> on you know like now i see this on um you know private private social media channels that i'm on where people are like you know here's the gift like, <laughs> i remember when people used to use those yeah. even i'm a little bit too old to have been <laughs> using them when they first started i think because i was uh so you know grown up at the time <laughs> Okay. Yeah, I'm on the cusp. <laughs> yeah. Um, for now, for now. Yeah, but then we'll have now. this conversation in 20 years and you can <laughs> lay out for the next person, you know, uh, to come on, like <laughs> what it was really like, a, a good oral history of social media in what your experience. What know what's next? Like what will be after like one minute videos? Because, you know, TikTok videos used to be like, I think the limit was, um, it was less than two minutes and then they made them longer and now you can have really long videos and it's the same on Twitter you know there used to be a character limit and now you can write essays on there really so it's like you know where's it going to go where's it going to stop yeah yeah I mean it's kind of following trends and yet in some ways following what people want so maybe maybe right now we're seeing like the increase in word limits and the increase in lengths of videos, just like we saw on YouTube, you know, used to be only 10 minutes, but that was because they didn't have the technology to let everybody upload, you know, 24 hours of an alarm bell ringing or whatever it is that people (laughs) upload nowadays for 24 hours. I mean, they just didn't have the the server space, right, to do that. And they probably still don't, but they're doing it anyways. Um, but now it seems to be, you know, we're we're reaching a kind of point where we have the technology and it's sort of we get to find out what kinds of practices humans actually prefer. So it's not just what we're, we're butting up our heads against, like not just the, the technology anymore, because the technology allows TikTok videos to be kind of as long as they need to be. Yeah. So we're going to find out, which is kind of exciting because we'll start to get to find out like what it is that people like, you know, through all these this data that they collect, like they know how long people look at movies for and when they click away or swipe away and, you know, what kind of, what kind of engages um, their attention, which is kind of scary, but also um, really exciting in a way, because you get to know, you know, something about humans. I think when you, when you start to analyze what it is that people really like engage with, what they love the most what they like engaging with the most like then we kind of learn about ourselves which i think is really interesting i mean a lot of people have been saying because of tiktok you know our attention spans are getting shorter and shorter and i mean short films have always existed but i think now with tiktok like they're a lot shorter like i can be entertained by like a five second clip (laughs) and then swipe onto the next one so you know it's it's interesting and even now like in 10 seconds you can tell a full story if you if you want to and I feel like you know before I don't think people I wouldn't say wasted their time on that but people just thought well if I want to tell a full story I want to tell the whole thing and like now people are like you just need to see the key parts people are just putting out the parts that they want to tell you and then it's done after like 10 seconds and you're like oh that was nice. Like, swipe, and then the next one. So it's interesting. Now that I know that TikTok collects our data, I sometimes watch the end of videos, even though I'm bored. <laughs> just because, <laughs> just because, like, I don't want to. I feel bad for the person, and I'm like, oh, that was really nice that they made this video. It's a bit boring, <laughs> but I feel like I should just sit here and go do something else while it plays out, just so they can get the. <laughs> the algorithms I mean, to kind of pick them up a little bit more. But then I'm, I'm, I, you know, it's like, you know, what they say about AI. If you, if you seed AI, if you teach AI on, on garbage, then it's like garbage in, garbage out. So, yeah. you know, you want to, you want to train people to make better movies by. <laughs> having I mean, there is an issue with that though, because a lot of the time I have fallen asleep on TikTok and I wake up <laughs> and there's just a video that's been playing probably for hours. <laughs> Yeah, there's some poor coder somewhere who works for TikTok who's like looking at your data and is like, ah, someone fell asleep. Classic fall asleep behavior. (laughs) (laughs) Just plays forever. (laughs) 
I wonder what other kinds of data they can probably know if you're actually like holding your phone if they feel it like move around or something. Oh, that, no, that's, that's weird. <laughs> it's so weird. Oh, God. That would be scary. <laughs> Okay, let's talk about the future of film studies. Like, what's on the horizon? We were talking about, you know, kind of social media platforms. Um, but I want to know more about the future of film studies and specifically the future of movies. Because um, somebody I was listening to recently made a really good point about TikTok, which is that TikTok's um, main competitors aren't really Instagram and Facebook or Twitter. It's not a social media in that respect. Its main competitors are Netflix. It's an entertainment. Yeah. So I thought, oh, that's really interesting. Yeah, because you're on it and you're not necessarily there to connect with people that you know. You're there to connect with, well, just to be entertained, right? So that's yeah. a that's a very different reason to go to the app, right? Um, that's why I go to Netflix to be entertained. And I thought, yeah, that's exactly what we're doing with TikTok. So with that in mind, um, do you see TikTok as a kind of competitor to other online streaming platforms? Um, I would say yes, because I was actually thinking that. Um, I've noticed with Netflix, they show you recommendations now based on what other people who like what you like, like. <laughs> That's a really <laughs> long-winded way of saying it. But like now it's kind of like, um, you know, what people near you are watching or, you know, even now, I think someone did um, like a short study on the type of thumbnails that they show you, and it's based on the ones that you click. So if you click a certain type of actor a lot, they will show, for example, if you clicked the male actor most often in the film, thumbnails with that male actor, they'd show you films with either the same male actor or if they were like a secondary character in the film they still put that character in the thumbnail so you would click it so it's kind of like they do have an algorithm that is kind of creeping up onto the kind of tiktok-esque type algorithm but i don't think it will be a while until we're quite there especially because um you know they've stopped like password sharing and all of that so i think it will be interesting to see where it goes um reggae jean page on is on a lot of people's netflix Thumbnails, probably. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, like, um, you know, I think, I think Netflix is about to go in a completely different direction. Um, I'm not sure where that's going to be, but it's, it's very interesting. I think it's going to be more socially directed. So what, what you're saying basically is like, our input is already creating, um, helping to create like the new media for sure. Um, in a sense, it's like holding up a mirror to what we want. But I wonder to what extent, you know, um, user generated media will be included in, in platforms like Netflix. Like, you know, obviously it's all amateur made and you can imagine shows and TV shows that would be created around amateur storytelling. Um, I don't know that they would be very popular, but they would they, they certainly could in theory exist. But um, it seems like we're pretty far away from, you know, kind of like the same quality or the same uh, kind of caliber of, of storytelling on TikTok than we are seeing in Netflix. I mean, there's a whole industry right behind creating TV shows and movies that appear on these streaming sites. And then and then you've got like amateurs making making film talk and stuff. I mean, they're pretty far. They're kind of miles apart in terms of like their target audience and their um and their aims but maybe not actually maybe not an audience I guess that's the big the big um time will tell yeah. sort of question oh I have noticed if I remember correctly on the mobile app for Netflix that is um kind of like YouTube shorts and you can scroll up and it shows you little clips of Netflix films and you can like like them add them to your list and it looks exactly like TikTok it's only on the mobile version, if I'm correct. But it's kind of like other apps are trying to copy this. It's kind of like um, Instagram Reels, for example. These things weren't a thing before TikTok was a thing, and they're laid out exactly the same as TikTok. So I think, you know, they are trying to imitate it, but I'm not sure if they'll get as, as far as TikTok has. I would say TikTok will definitely 
stay as like I don't know legendary status <laughs> because it has paved the way for a lot of filmmakers I would say yeah it would be interesting to find out what happens with the um uh the kind of grilling that it's going on in American um politics right now yeah and honestly ha, you know I can't I can't read the tea leaves on that one or know exactly what what they're what they're doing with that it does seem like it's very much scaring TikTok users because I see a lot of TikTok users um, trying to funnel their audience into things like their YouTube pages um, yeah. so that they don't, if it, if they suddenly do get banned, uh, that, um, that is if the platform gets banned, they won't lose their target audience, right? So you yeah. see people kind of saying, don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel as well. Um, because they don't want to lose that. It's, it's, it's become an income for people. Um, TikTok is a point of sale, um, whereas Netflix just isn't, right? I mean, you've, yeah. you just pay, pay for Netflix like once a month. Um, but TikTok is a point of sale for people who are selling things on it, right? So you don't really want to lose that, um, uh, that ability to... Um, kind of communicate and sell things to a specific kind of audience which is which makes it so much different than all the other social media um, platforms out there I'm not really sure uh, how what that has to do with like our conversation about the future of film studies but it is really an interesting difference I think that TikTok has um, in comparison to other social media platforms because I, I've never seen another social media platform have a little button at the bottom of it that says, oh, if you want to really, if you want to buy this, uh, you know, um, uh, this microphone that I'm using or this, um, you know, water bottle that I'm drinking from, like, just click here and the person who sold it to you gets a little commission from the TikTok shop. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's and totally, totally, like, I'm, I tell people my age this and people older than me this and they go, what? It's not doing that. I'm like, yeah, that's that's what it's doing. Yeah, and they kind of don't believe me at first because it's on the one hand so obvious, but on another hand, you know, so new and obvious that they don't want to believe that that's possible, right? Because yeah. it's something that we all joked about 10 years ago. Oh, you know, that like one day it'll just be like, you should buy this water bottle. And then a little <laughs> button will pop up and you can go buy a water bottle and you're credit card details are already there and the water bottle will be in your house like at 9 p.m that evening from the local amazon fulfillment center and it's like that's what's happening right now. <laughs> yeah, but it is interesting and it also makes you think like what happens with um these sellers when they move away from things like amazon and facebook marketplace just onto tiktok because you know when you sell things on tiktok you your brand is more i would say it it's closer to the customer. So I'd find that like, let's say I bought a water bottle from TikTok, for example, because you're, there's like a more personal relationship. Well, I'd say like a psychosocial relationship with the business and the seller, it kind of creates a law. So for example, I don't know if you've been on cake talk. No, there's okay. Like, I've, been, I've seen cake. Is it like, is it cake? Yeah, like there was this lady, she decorated cakes but apparently she copied a cake and she charged too much for a cake. And now people are making documentaries on TikTok about this lady <laughs> who's on Cake Talk. And it's like, they all kind of feed into each other. So it's interesting, like even people who are, you know, selling their own cakes, they talk about this Cake Talk scandal because it brings more people to their business. So, you know, we are all kind of just brought together by things that wouldn't necessarily link us on YouTube, for example, or I don't know, you wouldn't necessarily be talking about someone on Facebook Marketplace, uh, like in a short YouTube video, like it's, it's a TikTok thing. And it's, I think the future of film is definitely in TikTok. It's in kind of real people making their lives seen. And I think that's, it's interesting, definitely. I think it's a reason to study film. <laughs> that That's a really yeah. good point. I mean, at the very least, you can imagine that there will be either amazing or cheesy movie out there which will be about people using TikTok or something yeah. like TikTok that's and how true. it kind of affects people's lives. Because what we're really talking about is like, that's just gossip, right? Yeah. She made it. She made a cake she charged too much for. I would never charge that much. Here we go. <laughs> Let's go, everybody. <laughs> yeah 
gossip, right? I mean, so it comes back to, it it starts as social media, it goes away from social media and it becomes something else, something more um, with a craft behind it. But then it kind of comes back to social media, which is kind of interesting. I mean, that aspect of it, that sort of gossipy aspect of it kind of makes it sound like it's more like social media. Um, But how is that any different than um, the plot of the Tiger King? That is true. I would say, like, even, like, on TikTok, there's a lot of film analysis that kind of just gets disguised as gossip. And it's like, you know, you're analysing film. (laughs) Like, you know, even, like, something as simple as, I think there was, like, a empty coffee cup, some friends, and something like that. And, like, someone noticed the coffee cups were always empty and, like, loads of people were talking about it. It was like, you know, that's film analysis. They're a prop. It's... You know, there's a reason they're empty. I mean, you're not supposed to see that they're empty, but, you know, it's, I think it's something that's happening subconsciously because we are watching film so often. Now we're already kind of analyzing it without even meaning to. So I think, you know, when you study film, you know, you get to fully like delve into what you've always kind of been thinking anyway, but now you kind of understand it a bit more and now you can you know use it to maybe for your own entertainment or even to make your own films and it's it's just very complicated i'm not sure if i'm explaining it very well but no you are one of the things i always love about um telling people about movies that when you study them what happens when you study them and it's it's an often it's an anecdote that i use with my first year students in fact you might even remember from years ago i might have used the same anecdote so forgive me if you've already heard this but it's like when you've studied movies for a couple of years and you have some pretty good, um, a solid vocabulary of film studies behind you, um, terminology and so forth, um, you start becoming Cypher in The Matrix. I don't know if you've ever seen The Matrix. Yeah. He's looking at, he's the bad guy in The Matrix. And he's looking at the screen with like the the code that's like zeros and ones like streaming on the on the black and green screen that he's looking at. And he's going, you know, you see zeros and ones but I see blonde, brunette, redhead, because he knows what the code means. Yeah. And that's what it's like for film students, I think, a lot of the time, or anybody who studies movies for a couple of years, they start seeing into the picture what others don't see. So they sort of see the effects um, and the techniques that are used to, to garner certain effects, to kind of make certain effects, to evoke certain effects. And... You know, and then you can further utilize them yourself if you want to make movies. So you you kind of know the the so-called language of cinema in that way. Um, but I just love that it doesn't really dampen your appreciation for movies. It just makes you see them in a different way. Yeah, definitely. I think as well, when you study films, I would say you watch a lot of films that you might not have watched for entertainment but just to kind of, to watch them. Like, I feel like when you study films, you watch films for different reasons. Like, it's not just for entertainment, but it's to study the film itself. Um, Kind of like if you were to read a textbook and like, I don't know, algebra. (laughs) Like, you're not reading it for fun, hopefully. (laughs) You're reading it to study algebra. And it's kind of like that. Like, um, you get to, in a way, experience new things kind of oh gosh this is quite hard to explain but you get to experience new things in a way you wouldn't have necessarily done before studying film you might have watched a film because you know other people said it was a good film but when you study film you might watch a film because people said it was a bad film (laughs) or because you know maybe you watched a really bad film years ago and it didn't make sense but this time you watch it it's going to be like the best film ever (laughs) because they made it not make sense or you know, maybe it makes sense in a different way, or maybe you just didn't get it. And there's just so much, there's so many layers that aren't there with other art forms. So it is, it's really interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it can, it can do things like increase media literacy and kind of bone up on critical thinking skills in a way, which I think often, you know, people talk about in terms of, you know, one of the things that's really good about getting a university education is that you bone up on your critical thinking skills. And I think that's really true, but it doesn't mean that that's the only place that you can bone up on your critical thinking skills. I think movies 
and thinking, seeing lots of movies and, and all different kinds of movies um, will naturally enhance your critical thinking skills because they require you to kind of pay attention to certain problems that you might not have been aware of before and sort of put you in a position where you would never be otherwise without kind of being in the movie, right? Seeing faces, seeing places that you've never seen before, maybe you've never even thought about before, but because you're exposed to them in the movie, um, you're forced to kind of think about what you think about those issues, those people, those places, and have an opinion. And um, and also sometimes your views, your worldviews are challenged um, in ways that are kind of, you know, pretty, um, pretty uh, um, impactful, I guess. Um, so I think that's really one of the one of the coolest things about movies is that when you watch it, you never really know um, how the movie is going to affect you unless you actually sit down and watch it. Um, but, yeah, I, I hope that uh, I hope that with something like this we can bring the um, kind of our love of film studies out into the world and like hope, yeah. encourage people to sort of do it too. That's, that's, that they wouldn't be confined to sort of just, well, that's something that's nice for bachelor students, but you know, I'm, I'm, I'm that, that bachelor students, you know, have nothing to do with me. I'm either not going to go to university or I've already been many years ago and I'm not really interested anymore, but I think it's something that people should be interested in even outside of the university setting. Yeah, I would say it is definitely, um, it's a subject where it's not, I feel like with university, it's about um, what you've taken from, like said, piece of material. But I think with film, it is also about how it makes you feel. And I think that's a really good part of it, like what you've taken from the film that's unique to you and, you know, I find that with other subjects, there might necessarily be a right and a wrong answer. And it's like, it's not based on your experience as a viewer or your experience as a filmmaker either, even. And it's um, it's different in that sense, I would say, because you are kind of the consumer of the media, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you're you're the one that it's, made for in a sense I mean some yeah. movies are made for certain groups but usually most films that you see on Netflix Disney plus Hulu um, HBO etc are really for everybody they're they're meant to be for the lowest common denominator just anybody who can who can um, you know has eyes and ears and um, eyes or ears uh, whatever you know that can appreciate anything really because you don't really know um, <clears throat> who your audience is, you just know that they're humans and yeah. you just hope that you get the biggest audience as possible. So you wouldn't really necessarily try to target certain markets. I mean, sometimes that does happen, obviously, with certain genres and things. But um, at the end of the day, I think most media is really made for a general audience and um, they want the widest possible um, amount of people to to consume it because that's that's where they're that's how they get paid right yeah and even if that's not the case like um during lockdown when everything was online um there are a lot of lectures that had to be kind of filmed and put online like i would say the ones made by the film tutors were a little bit more engaging <laughs> but it's because <laughs> <laughs> it's because they had studied film so they knew kind of what would keep us a little bit more engaged whereas um you know if you used to just you know obviously you're a lecturer you used to speaking in front of a lot of people you know that doesn't necessarily translate the same way on screen on film so i think you know especially with the way um you know a lot of, a lot of people learn remotely it's something that is useful in like multiple areas of your life not just I don't know if you want to become a Hollywood filmmaker, you know, even if you want to be a lecturer, you know, study film, <laughs> you know, because you never know when you have to make a piece of content, you know, for your students to watch, to learn. And it's good to know what makes a good film. I, I hope I'm explaining that quite. Um, yeah, absolutely. It comes back to the conversation about 
you know, typewriters. I mean, yeah. it's, it's a tool now that is essential. And so therefore it's an essential skill, right? As an essential skill makes, um, I mean, an essential tool makes an essential skill eventually, right? So you have to um, engage with it, whether you like it or not. So you might as well frame the camera, right? And <laughs> get some lighting, get a better microphone um, and set up your, set up your YouTube um, lessons. As an yeah. How should we end this? Um, that's a good question. <laughs> um, maybe our least favorite films. <laughs> oh, that's a good idea. Yeah. I like that idea. Okay. Yeah. Marnie, what is, to round things out and call an end to our podcast, what is your least favorite film? I would say Star Wars. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um... Cut. Let's do it again. <laughs> Just kidding. No, I would say um... I'm going to say Mean Girls, and a lot of people are going to hate me for that. And it's just not a good film. <laughs> not Ooh. going to explain why. It's just an awful film. Ooh. Okay, <laughs> subject for another podcast um I have lots to say about that but I will say nothing I just accept your answer (laughs) okay so what's my favorite my least favorite film I've never had to answer this question before (laughs) it's a really good question (laughs) what's my least favorite film like even a film that you just would be happy to never watch again (laughs) that's a okay that's a good way to put it what would I be happy to never watch again? Um, Crash. I've never heard of that. Okay. <laughs> there are two crashes. Let me make sure I get the right crash. A 2004 crime drama film produced, directed, and co-written by Paul Haggis. Oh. <laughs> um, featuring Sandra Bullock, Don Cheadle, Matt Dillon, Jennifer Esposito, William Fitchner, Brendan Fa- Fraser, Terrence Howard, um, Lu- and Ludacris. <laughs> Chris. Oh, yeah, just... I, I already hate this film. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it's just about a car crash and a bunch of people screaming at each other. And I remember just think, leaving the cinema going like, well, I never want to have to see that ever again. I'm glad I saw it once, but... <laughs> I that's that's it I'm never gonna watch that movie ever again if I can avoid it it's just too much too much it's for the best yeah yeah <laughs> series recommendation for everyone listening beef <laughs> it's on Netflix it is about a car crash kind of but Ooh. it's really good <laughs> it's really good so see this is exactly what I thought when I saw the trailer for beef I was like oh that looks good but no it's about it's like crash it's not like Crash. <laughs> and I would say people probably love Crash, you know? I mean, that's probably somebody's favorite movie out there, and they're going to be angry with me for saying that it's not my favorite movie, but... Yeah, whoever likes Crash, maybe you just keep that to yourself. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I love that. So we're ending also on, on movie or TV show recommendations. Um my recommendation is a TV show that I'm currently watching called Sweet Tooth. It's in a second season. Um, it's a post-apocalyptic um, series set in the near future where, um, uh, wouldn't you know it, a pandemic has hit uh, planet Earth. Too close to home. <laughs> <laughs> but the thing that makes it really charming is that it's um, the protagonist is just a little ten-year-old boy who um, is sort of a um, deer-human hybrid person, and he's in fact the first oh, hybrid seen, person. Yeah, I've seen um, the thumbnail for that. Yeah, and um, he has to basically protect himself and survive in a world which is completely antagonistic to his. Um, his like identity as a as a um human hybrid human animal hybrid um and yeah i just think it's really sweet and it has some incredible uh acting and casting in it and um it's set in a world that kind of looks like um 
the U.S. but isn't actually the U.S. because it, it wasn't actually able they weren't actually able to film there because they were filming it during the pandemic so you actually <laughs> <will> see <laughs> um, uh, a place that's very otherworldly looking but is sp supposed to be somewhere in the United States I believe okay all right so let's leave it there um, okay. thanks everybody for um, joining us I hope you enjoyed it um, leave comments etc smash that like button yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Watch, <laughs> beef, please. watch beef <laughs> um, please be kind in the comments and uh, thanks so much Marnie for joining me and I'll see you again next time bye, bye.